get started more or less on time. Welcome to this special event hosted by the University of Virginia Center for Politics, the fifth edition of our Global Perspectives on Democracy uh, program and its ambassador series. I first want to thank our partners for this event, uh, President Terry Sullivan, who had a wonderful reception up at uh, Cars Hill, and I hope the students here ate all the food. She told you to do so. Um, we also want to thank the International Residential College, a frequent partner of ours. Thank you all very, very much. Again, uh, the Center for German Studies, it's pretty obvious why you co-sponsored, uh, and the German American Association of Central Virginia. I was told you had quite a large membership, so we're delighted to join forces uh, with you. Uh, the uh, ambassador has been here most of the day. We've had a wonderful time with him. We've gotten a world tour from him, or at least we did at lunch, because that was off the record. So I can't tell you that that was really interesting. <laughs> um, that's terrible. That's terrible. But uh, we even talked about the American presidential election, and he, he promised me he would look into uh, refugee status <laughs> for some of us after November. <laughs> Let's hope we don't need it, but you never know. <laughs> I saw the, uh, met with the uh, Australian ambassador recently in, in, uh, in D.C. And he indicated they have lots of vacant desert territory. So that's another place. Uh, you know, the, no one will find us there. So that's anyway, we hope we do. Mr. Ambassador, I think you can see how um, excited we at the University of Virginia are to hear from you simply based on this large number of partners, co our co-sponsors for the event. And there could have been more. We cut it off at a certain point. Today, uh, we're, we're honored to welcome His Excellency uh, Peter Wittig, the Ambassador of Germany to the United States. We're going to hear, of course, directly from the Ambassador, and he's indicated he doesn't want to lecture very long, about 20 minutes, and then the rest of the time is going to be tough questioning from you. And you've seen how it's done in the presidential debates, except I want to, see, I want to say one thing to you. Audiences should be seen and not heard that's something I hope we'll get back to in 2020. And these debates have turned into the Roman Colosseum. <laughs> Except for the Lions. That's the only thing we haven't had this year in the presidential debates. We're not going to do that because we are polite at Mr. Jefferson's university. Uh, the ambassador has served as uh, the German ambassador to the United States since April 2014. And he has an incredible career in the, in the uh, foreign service. He was German ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, he represented uh, Germany during uh, its tenure as a member of the UN Security Council from 2011 to 2012, and had so many other hosts. Uh, he uh, joined the German Foreign Service in 1982. He served uh, as ambassador uh, in Lebanon, ambassador in Cyprus. He was the German government special envoy during the division of Cyprus and again. We could spend 20 minutes just going through his, his uh, remarkable uh, CV. Uh, Charlottesville, we want you to know, maybe you heard this in Monticello today when you went up, but our founder, Mr. Jefferson, had a, had a long history of relationship with Germany, although you properly noted, though he spoke seven languages, German was not among them. And so, as you noted, these students are going above and beyond our founder, which is almost never done. It's kind of sacrilege. But we're delighted that you're, that you're doing so. But when Mr. Jefferson was governor of Virginia during the Revolutionary War, Charlottesville was host to, I hate to say this, an internment camp that included Hessian prisoners of war who fought on the side of the British. Jefferson quickly developed friendships with a number of the interned Hessian officers, and he hosted them at Monticello, and even introduced them uh, to his circle of friends here in Virginia, and a very special bond uh, developed, and uh, Jefferson actually rented a house uh, to, I believe, one of the officers near Monticello, and they joined each other frequently for social and cultural activities. If only our presidential candidates could treat each other with such civility. That's really quite remarkable. Uh, in any event, we are so pleased and so honored to have someone who, who knows the world and uh, we have the world at our fingertips tonight, uh, thanks to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Germany to the United States. Please join me in welcoming 
Ambassador Peter Vitti. <laughs> Professor Sabadou, thank you so much for your kind words of introduction. Uh, I'm extremely flattered, especially as those nice words um, come uh, from a renowned political scientist and analyst, and uh, I can assure you uh, in, in Washington, D.C., Professor Salado is a household name. Uh, I, was, I was giving a hint that it should make this pilgrimage um, to uh, this university uh, because of him, and I got good advice on the state of uh, the presidential race um, today. Dear students, dear faculty, ladies and gentlemen, it's a special honor for me uh, to be the guest of not only one of the best, but also um, one of the most beautiful uh, universities in, in the U.S. Um, and while visiting um, Thomas Jefferson's other masterpiece, Monticello, today I also learned that he has mastered seven languages, uh, including the ones that are really difficult, Latin and Greek and, and English, but only one language, as you mentioned, by his own account, exceeded his abilities, and that is German. Uh, and in case you, you need another reason uh, not to go on spring break or on your next vacation, uh, but to study your German uh, grammar book instead, and uh, here it is, you will have the very rare opportunity to outperform the author of the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> the mastermind of the Bill of Rights. So I encourage you to attack uh, the difficulties of the German language. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you may know uh, serving as ambassador entails uh, various uh, tasks. Uh, some are very routine tasks, and uh, some are uh, very enjoyable. Um, and I'll give you a couple of um, uh, examples for the more enjoyable ones traveling, for instance, to Puerto Rico to inaugurate a new Lufthansa aircraft service, or visiting the Caucasus in Iowa, uh, where one leaves highly impressed uh, by all the people uh, making their way through high walls of snow just to be able to discuss and vote, or throwing the first pitch at a baseball match in Cincinnati where the Reds uh, are playing the Milwaukee uh, Brewers are on the German Heritage Day. Now those are really nice, nice experiences. However, among my favorite obligations is certainly talking and discussing with students in the U.S. Uh, I seldom find groups that are more challenging and more stimulating uh, than that, and so I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you uh, tonight. I'm sure um, that um, uh, this will be uh, no different uh, today uh, because uh, you are among the brightest students in the U.S., uh, so I was told, um, and because um, it, you are all studying at a university whose focus, research, and teaching were shaped by one of the first U.S. ambassadors to Paris and the first Secretary of State, a passionate diplomat who shaped the cooperative, transparent diplomacy that would eventually become our modern, rules-based international order. Yet, being in public service can be challenging for me. I remember myself coming out of the night meetings at the United Nations in New York headquarters, grumbling that I had still not seen much of New York City after a few months on the job, but public service is also a particularly rewarding path where one can make a real difference, where one can truly contribute to the public good. In these last few months, serving as ambassador in the DC, uh, which have seen numerous crises, but also successful international policy making and easily testify to this fact. However, I did not come here as a senior diplomat to speak uh, just uh, about my uh, past career. You wanted to hear more about the current crises, challenges, and opportunities in our transatlantic relations. So I might, in this time of seemingly infinite turmoil, start with the good news. 
The cooperation between our two countries is excellent. Uh, probably as good as it has ever been. Uh, this is certainly true of the particularly close relationship uh, between President Obama and uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, but it also applies to the relationship between Foreign Secretary Kerry and his German counterpart, the Foreign Minister Steinmeier. Best buddies is how a German newspaper recently described their relationship. One could also easily apply this assessment more generally to the German U.S. cooperation on nearly all levels of administration. The transatlantic engine is strong and multifaceted. And let me give you a few examples. Number one, in the fight against uh, the so-called Islamic State, or ISIL, in Syria and Iraq, the U.S. and Germany have been important drivers of the peace talks that culminated in a cessation of hostilities a few days ago. Uh, and actually, they were resumed, the Syrian peace talks, um, today as we speak. Both our nations are striving hard, using political and military means to bring down Islamist terrorism, to end the atrocities in the Syrian civil war, and to stabilize the country. Second, the nuclear agreement with Iran, after very tough and lengthy negotiations, we have reached an agreement with Iran, and that we means the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council of the US, China, Russia, uh, France, Britain, and uh, Germany, the so-called P plus five. We have reached an agreement with Iran that will prevent that country from developing nuclear weapons. We are now closely and strictly monitoring the implementation of that agreement, as well as recent Iranian elections um, that just happened um, last week. They will, by the way, or I think two weeks ago, they will, by the way, most likely strengthen, and it, it is actually now a fact, that they will strengthen the reformers in Iran and hopefully, step by step, open up this difficult country closer to the West. And you might know uh, almost 50% or even 50% or more are, are under the age of 30. So the Iranian civil society is not only vibrant, it's very young, and it's hard to believe for, for some Americans, but it is the civil society that is most open to the West and uh, has a particular um, liking and sympathy for the United States. This does not mean that we are blind to Iran's role in the region and that Iranian aggression such as the recent missile test, will remain answered. But we have the hope that over time, this Iranian nuclear agreement might uh, also uh, spill over into other areas of conflict in the region and beyond, and turn Iran into a more responsible stakeholder in the region. Another example is the Ukraine and um, our relationship with Russia. Um, in Ukraine, uh, the U.S. Um, and uh, Europe uh, did not always agree on the mix of deterrence and detente uh, in its relation, in our relationship uh, with Russia, or you can also say uh, stick and carrot. But uh, we jointly countered successfully the Russian aggression in the Crimea and in eastern Ukraine with a strong and effective sanctions regime and imposed costs, not only economic, also political costs, and, uh, on Russia, and supported what is known as the Minsk process, the diplomatic process that sends, sets out a roadmap towards a political solution uh, in the, of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. In Eastern Europe, we have drawn clear red lines and given reassurances to our allies in the region. Our joint message to President Putin is clear. We do not seek confrontation. We seek a partnership based on trust and common values. 
But there are limits, and we are very prepared to defend these limits as well as our allies. Um, another um, case in point um, of our successful transatlantic relationship is trade. So, um, that was highly unlikely a couple of years ago, but now the US and Europe are proceeding to more common ground. The transatlantic trade and investment partnership, creating a free trade zone between the US and Europe, the, the two biggest trading blocks in the world, is currently under negotiation. It has the potential not only to boost trade between um, Europe and uh, the US, but also investment, and it cause, could potentially be a kind of a blueprint for the global trade system in the world as a whole. With this, it's called TTIP, Trade and Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, we can set uh, the gold standard, uh, the high standards for um, workers' rights, for environment, for food security, for, for the whole world and write the rule book of international trade. So it is a very important project and we put a lot of emphasis on this and, and we hope that we will, in the remaining time of this um, Obama presidency, make headway on, on such, a, on such a, a treaty. Europe and the United States were also at the forefront of concluding an ambitious international agreement at last year's UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, ensuring a long-term transition to clean energy solutions. Our cooperation is certainly far from perfect and there are areas where we need to do more. The refugee crisis that started last summer and has hit Europe, by the way, Europe was not really prepared, and in particular Germany is probably the most prominent example. Germany has accepted 1.1 million uh, refugees alone in 2015, a figure that would be roughly equivalent to the US taking in 4.4 million asylum seekers. These numbers speak for themselves. But let me make this very clear. This is a human migration of epic Proportions. And it is probably the most daunting challenge for Europe since the Second World War. It is almost, has almost become an existential crisis for the European Union. It is self-evident, as our resources are limited, we will have to reduce the numbers, uh, bring down the numbers of refugees and migrants that are coming into our country nationally, but also through international cooperation. Firstly, the European Union as a whole must act here. A harmonization of our asylum laws, the joint protection of our common borders, and a fair distribution of refugees in the European Union are just a few key areas where we need to act. However, the refugee crisis goes beyond the new Europe. It is an international crisis. Granted, the U.S. currently is not as effective and it is in, in the comfortable situation of being able to sharply limit the number of refugees from the Middle East. That's geography. You have big oceans in between. But only in a joint approach that addresses the causes of the refugee influx will we be able to solve this crisis. This is especially the war in Syria. This is one of the major root causes. Improving um, the situation in the refugee camps, supporting the transit countries in the region, um, that is uh, the best way to tackle the root causes of that the refugee crisis. And it also entails the solution, a fair distribution of refugees, acknowledging that we all have a humanitarian responsibility to the refugees on an international level. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you at the outset um, that I would start with a positive message. 
So let me also be a bit more critical now. The solid basis on which our strong relations rest, our closely knit values and common tradition should not lull us into complacency. There is a prevailing view among Europeans, especially young Europeans today, that sees America less as a land of opportunity and more as a threat to personal privacy and data protection, as well as consumer standards. <clears throat> On this side of the Atlantic, we find a seemingly increasing kind of casual indifference towards, in this case, German culture beyond World War II and Oktoberfest and, and luxury uh, premium cars. And by the way, this is one of my tasks as an ambassador with my uh, rather big embassy to, to counter this uh, rather traditional narrative and showcase that Germany is a, a modern uh, country, country of ideas and innovation and a land of free college education and cities full of life and culture like Berlin. Besides, our societies are rapidly changing. With the immigrant population growing in both of our nations, we also have to come up with a more nuanced image of each other. A Hispanic American will be understandably less attached to the history of the Cold War in Europe, just as a young Turkish immigrant in Germany will have a much looser connection to the role of the U.S. in liberating Germany from the Nazis or ending the Holocaust. So we need to do more to spur our people's interest in transatlantic relations and foster a true transatlantic dialogue, especially among people of your younger generation. What are these new topics and themes? What can take us to a transatlantic dialogue 2.0? Uh, Immigration and integration must become one of the central topics. While America has been known as a melting pot that succeeded in integrating multitudes of people of different origins and ethnicities into American way of life, it is lesser known that Germany and Europe have also grown into societies with substantial immigrant populations and have had remarkable success in integrating them over the past decades and long before the current refugee crisis started. About 20% of all the people living in Germany today are themselves immigrants or have at least one immigrant parent. So our respective strategies and approaches in dealing with this challenge can be beneficial to both sides of the Atlantic and make our ongoing dialogue fruitful for those who are concerned. I always tell my German uh, fellow countrymen, uh, we can learn a lot from the U.S. approach to diversity. Besides, both our countries have mastered different aspects of modern innovation and technology. Silicon Valley has been unsurpassed in IT, while German engineering remains unchallenged in the world. U.S. college education, and I'm not saying this to flatter you, is envied all over the world, while the German vocational training system for skilled labor combining on the drop training in education has become a role model for many other countries. Looking for synergies and cooperation in this field will not only boost innovation and economic progress, it will also bring young people closer together. At the same time, when talking about the opportunities of modern technology, we need to have a deeper exchange about issues like who owns data, how much of access should Google and company have to one's privacy, how should they handle personal information, what are the limits of government surveillance and bulk data collection. Those are important questions 
um, for the digital age to find the right balance between legitimate security interests and the right to privacy. And I think we, we are not uh, yet um, in, in, in a robust and open dialogue between our two societies, uh, and that needs to happen. You see, the field that defines the transatlantic partnership is rich. It is not restricted to lofty, lofty speeches delivered by diplomats on the importance of transatlantic ties, but it extends to thousands of people-to-people -people contacts and relationships, from students to young people to scholars to scientists to cultural and social figures to business and political leaders. And these ties especially depend on you and how you, the other young people like you, will fill them with life. Thank you for your attention, and if you like, I'd like to answer your questions. I'm David Irby. I'm the Director of Global Initiatives at the Center for Politics. We are going to have people line up at the microphones. There's one over here and one over there. And all we would ask is that you come forth with questions. I know we have very intelligent people here who often love to get speeches about what they're passionate about. We love that. However, uh, we have the ambassador from Germany here, and I know there are plenty of questions. And he is here to answer the questions. So please go ahead, take a moment, line up. And uh, then we'll proceed. Ambassador, uh, thank you for coming. Um, over the weekend, uh, unfortunately, the party lost in the elections. How will this impact uh, Germany's role in immigration? Thank you for that question. Uh, you followed um, the topical events very closely. Um, those were regional elections or local elections, so it was not a national election. So in a way, she did not lose, but what is right is that her party lost, and uh, the party of her coalition party, which is a center-left party, lost as well. So the two parties uh, that formed that German government um, didn't fare well at all in those regional and the beneficiary was sort of a right-wing uh, party that is new, and it's called Alternative for uh, Germany, and they uh, scored sort of double-digit uh, figures in those three regions. And that is something that has shocked um, many Germans. Uh, it, it testifies to um, the fear uh, that revolves around uh, the migrants and the refugees coming to Germany. So I would say uh, this is not something totally unexpected. Uh, there is a segment in the German society that is uh, that believes that we were overwhelmed with the refugees, that see a lot of social problems occurring, uh, that. Um, see the refugees in terms of a culture clash because most come from um, Muslim countries. And, and there is, uh, and I think one has to be very clear about it, a xenophobic element also in that party that just simply rejects any foreigners coming in. So that's a, a development that does not jeopardize uh, the government of Angela Merkel, but it is a sign that um, the sheer number and the speed of refugees coming to my country, and we were the main recipient by far um, of those refugees, is not uncontested. Um, will it change uh, the policy of the Chancellor? Uh, my prediction is no. Um, she will uh, work hard to bring the numbers of refugees down through a set of measures, as I explained, uh, an understanding of Turkey, Turkey being the gateway of Syrian refugees um, to the European Union, 
working hard uh, also through financial transfer so that the refugees in the vicinity of Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon, and Turkey stay in the region and not move on, and uh, better border protection uh, in, of the countries in Europe, like Greece and Italy, and also uh, better border management by Turkey. And we hope that all those measures, including better asylum procedures, faster procedures in Germany, will eventually um, drive down um, the, the numbers of refugees. The Chancellor has always said um, there is no cap on the right to asylum. And, and she has been steadfast. Um, she says we have to distinguish between those people who really deserve and earn asylum. Those are politically prosecuted and people fleeing a war or a civil war. But we cannot accept that everybody uh, who is just looking for a job or a better economic life. And this distinction has to be made and has to be enforced. And that means also some people that are not refugees have to be repatriated. That's what, what, what her position is. But um, she also believes that we cannot just push a button. Uh, or have a magic wand, how to stop that, as I said before, almost epic movement of people from the Middle East, the Middle East, which is a region basically in flames, and North Africa, another very uh, fragile region, and increasingly Afghanistan, where also many people are coming. So, no easy solutions, and this is what some people uh, cannot understand and have difficulties with. Um, so, do you think, um, or what, will there be, or is there currently um, any integration programs being put in forth um, for these refugees to adapt to life in Germany, specifically speaking, education for children of these immigration families who don't speak German or English, and how would they integrate into the German school system? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, those refugees um, that come to our country and get a refugee status, uh, they will be granted asylum. Uh, our hypothesis is, and many refugees believe also uh, that uh, this is their hypothesis for coming to Germany, that they return once the crisis in Syria, the war is over. But we are clear-eyed about it. Many will stay for good and will not return because they have a better life, or they hope to have a better life in Germany. So we have to um, work hard um, to integrate them in our society as soon, maybe as of day one. And we learned a lesson from previous waves of immigration that, that, that we um, went through, basically in the 50s and 60s, where many, many Turks came to our country. And at that time, uh, we, we hosted them. We also thought they would go back, but they didn't go back. What we failed to do, although the integration over time worked pretty well, um, what we failed to do is offer them language classes. So this is one of the lessons. And the two lessons are bring those people in the labor market as soon as possible and teach them the language. So what we do now is we offer for all the refugees language classes in Germany uh, that are free, basically free. Uh, and um, get them, get the kids into schools. We have um, a mandatory um, school visit, no homeschooling. Uh, that, that is not allowed in our country. So they will get into German schools. They will learn German. Uh, for the adults, they get um, language um, education if, 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 if they play along. And then the challenge is uh, offer them uh, you know, workplaces. Uh, that's not always easy. Uh, some of them are skilled, some of them are unskilled. But that's one of the uh, basically prerequisites 
for the Swift Reed equation. Guten Abend, if I remember my German from 30 years ago. Uh, what do you see as the likelihood at this point of an exit of the United Kingdom from the EU and the short and long-term impacts of that on Germany and other EU countries? If I were clairvoyant, I could make money at, at the stock exchange. <laughs> uh, but this is a very relevant question. Uh, lots of people are worried. Uh, or excited, um, some of them in Britain, uh, about Brexit, um, as we call it. Um, my government and the German people uh, want to keep Britain uh, in, in the European Union. It's the now second biggest economy, it has just overtaken France as the second biggest economy in the European Union, Germany being by far the, the biggest. Um, it would change the whole equilibrium of the European Union. Um, we, we, we think, uh, sort of philosophically speaking, in terms of um, the political and economic approach, uh, we would like to see Britain in. It's a, it's a free market economy um, that adds a lot of value to our um, European Union. We just believe that it's part of our common family and our European home. Um, I, I cannot predict. Um, the outcome, there will be a tough uh, a political discourse uh, going on in, in Britain. Um, I think uh, the British are people of common sense. Uh, they will also weigh the economic costs of a, of a Brexit. Uh, some people you know, of the business sector warn now openly uh, of, of the UK leaving the EU because it would entail many, many economic unknowns, and I share that sense that the British would be better off economically within the European Union than outside. There's another corollary, I, I, I take it, and that's um, the Scottish question. Many of my British friends tell me that if the British decide to exit the EU, the Scots will um, want to have another referendum on whether they uh, continue to belong to uh, the United Kingdom. And then if they decide against um, staying the Scots, decide against um, being part of the United Kingdom, you would have probably uh, the bizarre situation that the Scots would um, remain in the European Union while England is, is outside. And I think that is something that even many British people um, want to avoid. But I'm not, of course, I'm not British. I'm uh, just giving you my personal assessment and our strong hope is uh, that the British in the end uh, decide and for the in camp. Uh, and and uh, I think that would be in, uh, in line with their um, rather pragmatic mindset that the British are famous for. <laughs> Uh, good evening. <clears throat> With Germany and the United States both being significant uh, contributors in scientific research and development, I'm curious, and also that you mentioned the complementarity of the German education system in technical areas and U.S. Uh, in less technical areas and more scientific areas. Are there opportunities that can be exploited by both countries for collaborating in addressing some of these major issues that face our our world, our global issues, and the scientific front, and if, if there are, what kind of mechanisms would have to be put into place to allow more collaboration between German researchers and U.S. researchers? Well, um, you mentioned the two fields, uh, research and innovation. Uh, this is something that where the stakeholders themselves uh, look and find their partners. So this is a free, uh, a world of free um, exchange. And uh, I trust that, you know, American researchers that would find it productive and profitable to work together with uh, their uh, German uh, counterparts in research and science will find them. So there is little that we as a, as a government uh, can do to bring them together. We can encourage this. We can finance this and, 
in that exchange program, what we do, but basically the way, um, you know, in our societies, research and, 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 and uh, innovation is, uh, is set up, uh, it's, it's a free, um, free play of, of, the, of, of the market forces. Now, the other issue is, is, is a different one, and that is the dual vocational training, that is not the academic research and innovation, but that's something that is one of our strengths in our system. We, we, only 50% in our country, 50% of one cohort, one age group, attends college. The other 50%, they um, go right into uh, the The real world, if you want, and, and take up jobs and undergo this training, what we call uh, the dual vocational apprenticeship training, and uh, that has uh, substantial advantages. First, my, my, my eldest daughter did it. She, she wanted to be an art historian, and she said it's so difficult to make money with um, a university course in art history. I want to do. Uh, I want to learn the trade, so she did an apprenticeship in, um, in, in, with, with an auction house. So after two years she got a very good certificate, and that is something practical, and she can enter into the labor market, and now she's doing her, her MA in art history. So you have the system of a very practical model of skill building. That's part of the backbone of our strength in the manufacturing um, industry. That, that, that's why young people, instead of going to college, studying four years of philosophy, you're not finding a job, rather sometimes, all of them, sometimes go and uh, do such an apprenticeship and immediately find a job. This is one of the reasons why we don't have a significant number of youth unemployed. We have our employment Unemployment figure, figure is 5%, and maybe youth unemployment is 6%. But most of them uh, are not long without a job. So this, this is a kind of a model that is now being copied by, by many countries, including um, many cities and, and federal states here in the US. And we, we have got an enormous interest in this kind of partnership between business and community college to devise curriculum for this kind of two-year apprenticeship. So it has become a little bit of a brand of German vocational training, especially in the manufacturing area. But that's on a different level of education. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, I was just wondering, could you speak more about the progress of the privacy versus national security debate in Germany? Um, could you speak more about the progress of the privacy versus national security debate in Germany? Um, I know Germany is leading in the right to be forgotten cases, and is the Apple FBI debate at all influencing the discourse in Germany? In acoustically, I understand all of it, but, but you want me to speak more about this uh, privacy uh, security debate. I think, uh, well, I mean, it all happened after the Snowden revelation, uh, as, as we know, uh, and it triggered a, uh, a spirited debate about this balance of ne legitimate national security interests and the right to privacy. It really has not stopped this debate. Um, and uh, this is why I raised it here. There is a fault line, um, you know, a transatlantic fault line. Many, especially young Europeans, uh, think that the focus of the U.S. is too much on, on national security and that the security services are um, ill-checked in, uh, in, 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 in their uh, power to survey and use bug data. Um, whereas I think here in this country, uh, the, the German obsession or the European obsession with privacy is, is sometimes thought to be totally exaggerated and basically triggered by some bygone <coughs> uh, 
um, experiences the Nazi and the Stasi and these German uh, uh, intelligence services surveying uh, the citizens. So I think sometimes we are looking through two different prisons. Uh, the U.S. is still very much looking through the national security prison, the 9-11 prison, and, and, and the Europeans uh, tend to look more through this privacy uh, prison. And, and, and my plea here is uh, to have a more open and robust debate about those issues. Who owns the data? Where are the limits of government surveillance? Um, what are private ET companies allowed to do with the data of the users? Um, how far can the consumer profiling go uh, that is being done by by IT uh, companies, etc., etc. That is, if you will, um, a, a, a modern transatlantic debate. We didn't have that uh, 10 or 15 years ago. We m might have debated about our relationship with Russia or with China. And now, for, for young people, this kind of issues is, is much more important because it, it, it is their experience, how they move in the digital world. So I think we, we need a, an open debate about that. I'm, 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 I'm sure we will not come to a blueprint uh, solution here that is applicable to all the societies. I think we will debate this for the years to come. I even think we are at the beginning of such a debate in the digital age. You will be with us, find this right balance for a long, long time. But um, politicians shouldn't avoid it. They should talk about it, and the civil society should also talk about it. So my question is actually really related to that. I um, was thinking about how you mentioned that um, digital data collection and privacy are a major unaddressed issue in the minds of the German people, especially in relation to Germany, U.S. relations, and Silicon Valley. So I wanted to know um, what you see as the role of the government the U.S. government and even the international governance in um, regulating data collection by private companies. And there's been a lot of tension between the U.S. government and companies like Apple and what Apple will and will not release to the government. Um, so what do you see as the role of the government in that and what kinds of demands would the German people make of companies like Google in their data collection? Well, um, first of all, I always have to tell my German fellow countrymen that there is a lively debate here in the U.S. as well about um, data protection. And Germans tend to think that it's just their concern and the Americans are, uh, don't have that debate. And this is of course wrong. There is, is a lively debate here going on and, and with some of the same arguments that, 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 we, that we have. It's a multi-layered um, topic. You have the relationship between um, citizens and the government in terms of surveillance and data collection. You have the relationship uh, between consumers and companies. And then you have the relationship, and this is what the question referred to, between companies and the government. Now this Apple case that is now being discussed between the FBI and, and Apple. So you have a a triangle of relationship that is a very complicated one. I mean, I don't have a, a recipe here how we should solve that, uh, but the legal situation, of course, is, is different in, in, in Europe and here. Uh, our uh, regulations are stricter and putting more emphasis on the, on the right to privacy, whereas in this country, um, the regulations are uh, uh, less strict and more emphasis, emphasis is being put on national security interests. Um, so that's why I'm saying um, in order, and, and this is relevant uh, when it comes to the flow of data uh, between Europe and, and the US. For instance, German firms want to be sure if, if they transmit data from, uh, from European uh, companies to their branches in the U.S. that uh, nobody else has access to those data and they want to have the assurance. Uh, so it is relevant even for the day-to-day -day economic life 
That's why we need to have a debate about this. I cannot offer here a, a recipe. I just know that there are a lot of fault lines out there. There's a lot of distrust on the European side vis-a-vis um, IT giants, vis-a-vis -vis the American government. There is a lot of misunderstanding from this side of the Atlantic and, and maybe also distrust vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Europeans. Uh, so this is a field where we have uh, to invest uh, more in, in, in a structured dialogue between our governments um, and our societies. Thank you um, for coming here. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us at uh, UVA and I, I want to talk, I want to ask you about this um, uh, IFD party, this new, uh, this new party, and I'm sorry to bring it up again. I mean, I'm, I am aware, I'm a German faculty member, I'm aware of how the country has been not xenophobic for, for these many years and how generous they've been as far as, um, you know, taking in immigrants, but um, I have been hearing something about this, uh, this new party, Alternative Deutschland, and I'm wondering about the demographics. What kind of people are drawn to it? You could mm -hmm. tell us a little bit. Yeah, you're speaking about uh, this party that just um, had, had, had a success uh, in double, double digits in, in three regions. Uh, the history of this party is um, unique because it started out uh, as a party that was against the bailout of Greece in, in that crisis surrounding the euro. So they basically said, um, we are paying for Greece, um, let's leave the euro, we want to have our Deutsche back. And, and it, they didn't have any other agenda than that. Um, they fell apart because the leadership bickered and got into an infight and sort of it, the, the party basically imploded and had vanished. Now with this stream of refugees, they, they got a new lease of life. And they took up this issue, and I think they, they pandered to, to people, and how can I call them? Uh, those who fear that they have been the losers of globalization, people who feel marginalized, free people that are driven by fear. It's very strong in East Germany. It's interesting. Uh, in East Germany where the, there is less history of diversity, and it's strongest in those parts of East Germany where there are no immigrants. That's the other uh, you know, curious thing. Um, so um, I, I would say it's not so much different from, if I may venture out a little bit in, into the domestic uh, political scene here, you know, some of the supporters of Trump, I think I have a similar motive. They also focus very much on immigration. And, and I, I don't think in, in, in this party is full of neo-Nazis. It's, it's rather people who cannot cope with this rapid change and who, who resist that rapid change and who cannot really understand what, why do we have now Islam in our country? And how do we deal with it? Uh, how do we cope with it? Will they and steal our jobs, will they um, take our welfare benefits, and so on. This, this, those are the issues that, it's a protest part. It's, it's, a, it's a party without a coherent party program. It's a typical, almost one issue protest party. So my, here I say my hope is that once the Low of migrants and refugees can be contained, that they will be waning in importance. That's my expectation. And we'll uh, have a few more extra questions. Um, I'd like to echo uh, the appreciation of others for uh, coming here to speak with us. I have uh, three short questions. One, uh, 
hard to get your job, as you know, American ambassadors or the vice president. Two, um, I believe it was after the Fukushima uh, nuclear meltdown that the community changed its policy about using nuclear power. And I wonder if you see that as irreversible. Three are the full budgets of the German intelligence agencies disclosed to German citizens as opposed to missing the world. Well, very diverse question. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is the easiest. How did I get my job? Uh, I was teaching in, in a university as a junior professor in Freiburg in South. West of Germany, and I became more and more bookish. And um, I was at a fork of the road and said, um, Should this be it that I become a, a rather mediocre professor at a small town college somewhere and maybe get stuck for the rest of my life in the town? And I thought, No, no, this should not be it. And I applied for, um, I applied for the foreign service. And, they, they took me on and I went to the Diplomatic Academy for two years and then I entered into the career and here I am. So that's the explanation. Um, second, Fukushima, a um, question of a different magnitude. Um, the uh, catastrophe in, in Japan it was a defining moment in 2011 and there was almost a consensus in the German society that uh, we uh, should not further uh, maintain nuclear energy. And one has to explain this. Uh, we, even before Fukushima, we had a, a broad movement, an ecological movement that called for ending nuclear power, uh, driven by the questions what to do with nuclear waste. Uh, and so we, assumption that we leave uh, sort of a toxic heritage to future generations without knowing what to do with this nuclear waste. Um, but there were also that this was compounded by this catastrophe uh, of, of, of the nuclear reactor basically exploding. So there was a very swift uh, discussion um, and uh, the almost revolutionary step that this government, with the support of the parliament, took this phasing out nuclear energy by 21, 21 or 22. I'm sure. So that's that's fine. That, that, I mean, eventually maybe there will be a new government, there can be a new government supported by the will of the people to 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 reconnect nuclear power uh, stations. But I don't believe that this will happen. So what this triggered is a, a focus, uh, sort of a very intense focus on renewables. And, and it made, this made our country one of the leading countries in the world in the renewables technology. has created a lot of jobs also in that industry. It, it, it is uh, expensive because the renewables are partly uh, subsidized by tax breaks. But the idea is the idea is that eventually we will um, get a, a large part of our energy needs out of renewables, especially uh, in electricity. So it is a little bit of a we are the vanguard uh, in industrial countries in shutting off nuclear power. Um, but so far it is has worked well. Um, the budget of our intelligence service, I think it is, as a, as a lump sum, it is open and it's being um, scrutinized by Parliament. Uh, I'm not so sure whether all the different, uh, it's, 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 I'm not so sure whether it's public in terms of the specifics, what the, I mean, all the budgets of other departments are online in every single dollar uh, or every single budget line. I don't think that this is the case here. But the 
bank sum, uh, the, the overall budget is open and is, is subject to parliamentary uh, oversight. <coughs> Ambassador, good evening and uh, welcome. It's nice to uh, hear your uh, remarks. My question is actually economic in nature. Um, last week, the uh, European Central Bank met um, and, and in doing so reverted to yet another uh, uh, series of extraordinary measures to ease monetary policy dubbed in the United States as the addition sink um, in the media. The question I have to you is you touched on vocational training, you touched on Brexit, touched on a number of other subjects, but what is it going to take uh, if it's negative interest rates or what is it going to take to get Europe uh, to grow at some reasonable rate mm -hmm. of economic uh, prosperity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, first of all, on growth rates, um, it is sometimes I, I, I fear or hear um, <coughs> Americans tend to believe that there's a huge gap, in, a huge growth gap. Um, this is not the case. Uh, we grew, Germany grew 1.8 percent last year, and the U.S. grew uh, in the vicinity of 2.5. So it's not really uh, a world of difference. Um, but um, you referred to the uh, QE, the point of easing of of the European Central Bank as a, as a measure to stimulate uh, demand and, and growth. Um, the, the bank is independent uh, and we respect that decision. Uh, we are um, more of a, uh, a different school of thought um, that I would describe as um, Rules friendly fiscal consolidation, either call it austerity, or we call it um, growth, growth fiscal, growth um, uh, friendly fiscal consolidation. Uh, we, we think growth um, can only be sustainable if it's undergirded by um, economic reform. We believe that many countries in the European Union have done too little to reform um, their labor market or to um, get uh, um, decrease uh, over-regulation, etc., etc. Uh, we are worried about um, some countries in the European Union that uh, lack competitiveness, so our path to growth uh, is more um, undergirded by uh, a demand for substantial reform um, of regulation in the labor market and also by investment. But investment, not only uh, public investment, but also private investment. And, and this is, we think, is the more sustainable path to, to growth. And we fear that the quantitative easing has, um, has, uh, has tried before and that we want to reach a certain level of inflation, which has not worked so far that you might discourage governments from doing the necessary and sometimes very bitter homework uh, to reform the own economy. Uh, that, that, that's our take on quantity of these Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being here, not only for being here, but also for speaking so candidly uh, about the politics here, because that's something that our, our ambassadors are either reluctant or unwilling or unable to do uh, over the decades, uh, so I appreciate that. So I have a kind of a two-part question that, that starts with a narrow and, and broad zone. Um, the first is, I was uh, intrigued by your, your statement that uh, homeschooling is not allowed uh, uh, in, in Germany, uh, which puts Germany uh, on a par with Virginia. Uh, because uh, we have some of the most restrictive uh, homeschool laws uh, in our nation. And so I guess the question would be, what is it that, of what is the government afraid that the parents might teach the children? Which broadens me to a, to a larger question, and it is uh, related to the, the political question. Uh, I've done, done some reading recently that uh, reports that 
it's not only the, the populism in America or uh, France or Germany, it's not just economic, but it's also personal, almost, I hesitate to use the word spiritual, that there's just a lack of common, uh, commonality, uh, there's a lack of shared values. Um, it's, it's like there's a hole in the soul of our country and of Europe. Um, when I look, when, when we see that the cathedrals of Europe are now empty and, and tourist trap, not tourist traps, but, but, but there's, but there's a lack of, um, of a, uh, of a spirituality of our nations. So it's kind of a small question, larger question of what is the government afraid that the parents might teach and uh, is there something larger that fails to unite us as people? Hmm. Interesting, yes. Well, I think the explanation on homeschooling is a historic one. Um, in the 19th century, uh, the mandatory school was a great social achievement, basically directed against the feudal system where only some of them would be schooled, some of the kids would be schooled in, you know, in, with private teachers. And it was a huge social achievement that in the 19th century, uh, the, the governments at the time, and in Germany it was a, a multitude of territories, some kingdoms, some cities, um, that they were obliged to provide education for everybody. So there is um, basically an anti-feudal measure and a social equality achievement, and that has survived the centuries. Now, for you, probably, homeschooling is a, um, a right to, you know, a, a, a private right to have every single parent has the right to educate their children as they like. But it's coming from a very different uh, tradition. So. Here, it's nothing um, that, that we would not, um, that we think homeschooling is worse. It's just the tradition, a little bit of sort of an equality uh, tradition as a, as a social service to a right and a duty of each family to send their kids to school and making sure that they will learn something and and, and have the same, you know, or a certain level of standard as a, as a citizen. So that those are very, two very uh, different uh, traditions, and we, the tradition is not um, uh, sort of interdicting the parents or, or, or policing the parents in, in what they teach their children. It was meant to be a social achievement against the feudal order. But, in, and then the spiritual question, uh, uh, what, uh, have we lost the bonds? Um, that, that, is very, that, that is very difficult to answer, but I have the feeling that the whole of the West um, is going to um, maybe one of the most difficult times, and I hesitate to overuse this word crisis, in the last couple of decades, we see that our international order, not only the transatlantic order, but the international order, is under stress. And it's the, the Western order that we created as a Western community uh, with our values, um, with, with you know, freedom of, of trade, uh, with openness, with tolerance, uh, also with resilience to defend it, it's being challenged. It's challenged by uh, the rise of, let's say, pre-modern forces like ethnicity, religion, tribalism in the Middle East. It's challenged by the rise of nationalism, for instance, in Russia, also in some parts of Eastern Europe. And, and, and sort of what we perceive as the post Cold War New Liberal Order, which we thought is, is a wonderful cooperative order of common values. I think that is under tremendous stress, as we've not seen for decades. 
that, that's why I believe we are living in a, in, 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 a, in a time of decisive change. And it's probably one of those moments where, moments where historians in 50 years will say, the years, you know, 14, 15, 16 were a game changer in, in our international relations. Can we relate that to, to spiritual values? I, I can rather say, uh, you know, the conflicts that we are seeing around this world, and that includes this refugee crisis, because it's a, it, it's like a biblical migration of people from continents to another continent. That, that stories might say in, in, in a couple of years that this has changed the face of Europe and, and maybe the face of the West. But I'm being here too. Uh, too philosophical. I'm, I'm not a clairvoyant uh, sage. I should not play the role. Last question. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, you mentioned your personal goal of improving the American perception of Germany. What do you think the cause of the current view is, and what changes do you think are necessary to improve the American perception of the, of the Germany? Well, I don't want to be misunderstood. I, I don't perceive a, a very uh, negative perception of my <coughs> uh, it, It's just, uh, I mean, I have to say from my experience in, in Washington, um, at least on the level of the political establishment, be it the administration or be it on the Hill, uh, Germany is perceived as, as the leading economic power in Europe and also leading in, in, in many political fields in Europe. So I, I have no complaint uh, that this image is too negative. Um, I sometimes feel that we didn't do a good job to project an image that corresponds to the reality in Germany. People just like uh, this image of a total best, and you say this, and you know, W, and a lot of beer, and and, you know, this kind of thing. And I, my, uh, my uh, impulse is um, I want to show people here that we are a modern land of ideas and innovation and that we go beyond the October best, beyond the, the, the beer and, and beyond the, uh, the wonderful cars and we're also a diverse country. So and, and I, 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 that's our job to do this. Uh, you know, that, that, that is what I, how I understand also my mission um, to do my best also with public diplomacy to convey an image that corresponds to the reality of my country. Uh, so sometimes, and I stand that fully, and I don't think we are the center of the world in Germany, but sometimes uh, the American audiences um, are still stuck in, in, in a very uh, traditional narrative and it's fed by the Cold War, Berlin as the center you know, of the free world, and the of the war, and, and so on. And, and my, my feeling is, yes, that's all very important. It's a good basis for what we did in the past together. But now we have to move on and see that there are some entirely new things like we, we have become a, also a kind of immigration. Uh, we, 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 we also, uh, you know, a very innovative country, a very uh, hotly debating country, and so on. So this was my my pitch, uh, basically um, a pitch that I uh, tell myself uh, what my mission statement is. <laughs>
And there are some flyers on the tables that we invite you to take on your way out. The next uh, ambassador in our ambassador speaker series uh, will be the Swedish ambassador, and he will be with us on April 26th. But just a couple of other things. Uh, we will have uh, John Dickerson, the host of Face the Nation, uh, with us on April 21st. And then some of you, any of you have ever seen the Zapruder film, you know the Secret Service agent who runs up to the back of the limousine. That is Clint Hill, and he will be with us on May 5th. We invite you to pick up the programs on the table to leave. Thanks for coming. Interviewed, interviewed on the honor call. Like it, it's absolutely true. Germany believes. Like,